put out a call for subjects that I could roll and ramble about, and Shock Treatment was the first person to respond to my request. So here it is. You want to know about forced software requirements or artificial software requirements, specifically like that of Windows 11, but we can extend this back. I think we should have a discussion more about general software minimum requirements. Minimum requirements for software are kind of ridiculous because the problem with a minimum requirement is it's arbitrarily set. What is a minimum requirement? Well, you assume that a minimum requirement means if you don't have this particular hardware and software and so on, then you can't run our software. In some cases, that's true. For example, it would be very difficult to take something that requires Windows 10, attempt to run it on Windows XP, and have it magically work. Chances are that's not going to work. Likewise, software, for example, like Handbrake, that requires at least SSE2 or something like that, um, and nowadays I think is only distributed in 64-bit variants, you can't really run that on a 32-bit processor from 2003 because it doesn't have all the fancy pants features. So there are some requirements that are hard requirements. However, we have seen time and again that a lot of requirements are artificial. Some requirements are even required because the software makers decided that that's the way it should be and it would be faster this way, but it's possible to patch around it and make software that doesn't meet the requirements work if you patch out those requirements. So I don't really know exactly what to say about software requirements other than they're kind of arbitrary and often they're kind of bullshit. I mean, really, what is it that you have to have to run Windows 11 or 10 or 7 or whatever? <clears throat> For example, I think the best example is actually Mac OS, because Mac OS, it spans a very large amount of hardware, but there are artificial requirements that make it so Mac OS cannot run on certain hardware. For example, I have installed the latest version of Mac OS as of this uh, recording. I don't remember what it's called, Ventura, maybe? Anyway, I've installed the latest version using third-party patchers that were designed by extremely clever people that I have the utmost respect for. Um, there are patchers for all kinds of macOS versions to make them work on older systems. Now, there is one combination that a patcher doesn't seem to exist for, and that is certain iMacs uh, that have ATI, before it was AMD, Radeon cards of a certain kind there's no drivers in newer macOS versions, so you don't get accelerated graphics, thus the performance is kind of crap. But ignoring that combination, because that's just that there's no driver at all, so even if you patch it, you can't magically make it work. But to be able to take an, a, a computer that the latest macOS is like two years from being able to support, like it's two years behind what the minimum is, and patch it and have it work perfectly except for a few minor nitpicks. The one I'm thinking of, I think, was a 2015 MacBook Pro Retina running Mojave, and the only bug the user was actually gonna have to deal with is a certain bug in a certain feature of the Photos app. I mean, that's kind of silly. So what prevented Apple from supporting the older version? I suppose what prevented them is they just didn't want to do it. There is a certain... Uh, th this really spirals into the backward compatibility discussion. Because to be backwards compatible, you have to provide support for older stuff, which means you have to provide code and code path alternatives for older stuff, which means there is some bloat required for backward compatibility. But I don't feel like... A 2015 Mac getting a 2024 Mac OS update, I don't feel like that's that big of a stretch these days. See, back in the 80s, let's just take another example, okay? Nine years apart, that's 
2024 Mac OS versus a 2015 MacBook Pro. So that's nine years. Back in the 80s, you had MS-DOS 3.3 in the early 80s. I don't remember the exact year. Um, I'm going to say 1986, just as an example. I don't remember the exact year DOS 3.3 was the thing, but I'm pretty sure that's fairly accurate. It could have been 88. Well, let's work with 86, just for fun. So 86, let's move ahead nine years. 1995. What came out in 1995? Windows 95. I want you to keep in mind, we have, we, we're talking about going from DOS, a single task command line operating system that works on computers with 256 kilobytes of RAM, a quarter of a megabyte, and an infinitesimal tiny fraction of a gigabyte. We go from that to Windows 1, 2, 3, 3.1, Windows for Workgroups 3.11, and we've even got Windows NT floating out around out there. And we make Windows 95, which comes out in 1995. So back in the day, back in the 80s and 90s, a 10 year or a nine year computer lifespan, you would go from DOS 3.3 which, by the way, didn't have edit.com, didn't have the full screen text editor. It had a line editor called Edlin that is analogous to X on a, uh, EX, that is, on a Unix system, where you have to pick a line to edit and edit line by line. The worst editor ever. No full screen text editor built into the operating system yet to Windows 95, which had the start menu, a revolutionary user interface paradigm that almost everything after it adopted. And to this day, in 2024, continues to generally still use. Even Linux or Unix desktops that have nothing to do with Windows, that are far removed from Windows, still generally use this start menu launcher paradigm. So you can't tell me that nine years is some sort of wackadoodle thing today because when I look back at the 80s and 90s and see a nine year gap I see DOS 3.3 and Windows 95 I see a jump from 16 to 32 bit computing I see a jump from floppy disks as uh, not even just floppies but five and a quarter floppies as the primary to hard drives as the primary storage mechanism for mass storage so if we're talking about these things, right, if we're talking about MS-DOS 3 to Windows 95, that, that's a nine-year gap. That's not that, that, that that's a huge difference. It, do, it might not seem like it today because a lot of you listening may not have even been alive then. But we're talking about 16 to 32 bit. There, there is a fundamental shift in everything in computing between that nine-year period. <clears throat> but then take Mac OS in 2015 and Mac OS in 2024, there is not a fundamental shift. Everything by 2015 was 64 bit. In fact, everything by 2015 was so 64 bit that by 2015, they weren't even selling all but the absolute most niche tablet embedded whatever 32 bit Intel Atom embedded systems. 32 bit had basically gone the way of the dinosaur by 2015. Nothing new in 2015 was 32-bit. Everything basically was the same thing as of 2015. So you move up to 2024, what's changed? Well, we have a lot more processor threads. We have faster network interfaces. Wi-Fi 6 came out. There's a lot of paradigms that changed, but what's really that big of a difference that the latest Mac OS shouldn't work on a nine-year-old computer? Honestly, not that much. The bottom line is that Windows, Mac, whatever, computing exceeded the needs of the user a long time ago. You could do in Microsoft Word in 1995 what you can do today in Microsoft Word in 2024. The thing is, you can do more in 2024, but how much more? The core editing stuff, nothing has changed. I mean, really, yeah, okay, you've got some extra features, you've got this BSAI integration no one asked for and a lot of people don't want, and that bloats everything. 
you know, you've got newer software frameworks, whatever, but at the end of the day, software bloat really is all there is to it. That's it. Software bloat. It's all software bloat. There's nothing but software bloat all over the place. And I get that hardware has changed, security has changed, security models have changed, runtimes have changed, features have been added, and so on. But if you really look at what you're getting, the, the sheer amount of stuff that you're getting, you're not getting that much now compared to what you were before. Even the 64-bit change, you'd expect stuff to double in size because 64-bit pointers and integers are double the width. So there is an assumed doubling in 64-bit from 32-bit. There is a fundamental shift, but it had already been done by 2015. 2015, you can't have a computer with less than two gigabytes of RAM, period, at all. And four gigabytes was the minimum that the vast majority of people recommend. Nowadays, it's eight or even 16. But what's different? There's really not that much different. And the fact that people can create patchers that just do a little assembly patching and magically make everything work proves it. It proves it so well. So soft, the, the, the whole notion that modern software needs a lot more, it only needs a lot more because programming techniques have gotten crappy. They're hiring crap programmers for low pay that program everything in scripting languages, in managed languages. Nobody writes good software anymore because all the people who are passionate about writing good software cost too much and are a pain in the ass. So they don't want to have to deal with that. They hire low paid, low skill tech workers to do the bare minimum and that's pretty much it. What we have today is the bare minimum. And granted, what we had in the 80s was the bare minimum, but when the bare minimum meant once the product shipped, you couldn't do shit about it, you couldn't patch it, you couldn't fix it. If the customer got it, that was all the customer would ever get, and they might run it for 10 years. You have no idea. When the bare minimum was that, things were a lot better. The bare minimum is not that anymore. Now the bare minimum is as long as the thing doesn't piss people off too much, we're good to go. It's a really crappy situation. And this whole notion that you need to have a newer piece of hardware to run this newer operating system is stupid. How much does it really cost them to keep support for the old system? They literally already have the support written in. Dropping support for the old system doesn't make sense unless it's going to be such a fundamental shift like 32 to 64 bit, such a fundamental shift, such a massive improvement that you can justify such a shallow cutoff. But when Windows 11 came out, what did they say? Most Intel systems that were older than seventh gen can't join in? Well, seventh gen was only like three or four years ago. We're talking about hardware that in terms of hardware life cycle, yeah, for a business, maybe they cycle out their PCs every three to five years, but the vast majority of people don't do that. Because computers from 2009 with an SSD upgrade and maybe a RAM upgrade can run Windows 10 no problem. People run Windows 11 no problem after a lot of tweaking and cleaning and ripping all of the bloat out. So you can't tell me that modern software somehow needs all of this artificial crap that it requires when people can just flip a few switches, turn off a few things, delete a few registry entries, whatever, and all of a sudden everything just works fine. I'm not buying it. It's BS. We all know it's BS. You're just trying to purge old hardware to make the job easier for your low-paid, probably imported workers that are basically slaves so that they can do minimal work and make it even more minimal to save you a few bucks. See, that's the thing, is that maybe the money that they save by paying crappier workers to do crappier work and crappier languages, maybe that buys the CEO another yacht. I don't know. I have no idea. But it's possible. In fact, it's likely. I would say that it's, it's probably what is really going on. How many CEOs have golden parachutes now? Software suffers because no one cares. <clears throat> because the only thing that anybody actually running the show cares about is how can we provide the bare minimum required to keep our customers around without compromising the amount of money going into my back pocket. And I understand the drive to make money. I have a drive to make money. I want to make as much money as I can because boy, oh boy, is life a lot easier when you have the money. I know money isn't everything, except it kind of is until you have enough of it. 
But these CEOs, they don't need that much. They don't want that much. It's just insane. What's wrong with these people? You know, if you deliver a superior product, you will get superior people. But maybe it's our fault. Maybe it's our fault as customers. Maybe the problem is that customers are stupid. Maybe we need to stop being stupid. Maybe we need to ask more. Maybe we need to say, look, a Windows operating system by itself demanding 8 gigabytes of RAM, that's a little stupid. Maybe we need to say, that's not okay, and put our foot down and say, no, I won't move up to Windows 11, because Windows 10, I can run four gigabytes on Windows 10 and still have things function. The browsers are at fault for that too, by the way, but the bottom line, okay, if you run newer software, the requirements are usually bullshit, and we know this. You can often run software on a machine that's way lower than the specs they require, and it's still function. So most software requirements are artificial bullshit, made up just so the developers don't have to provide more support to idiots who don't know what they're doing trying to run it on their $100 Celeron laptop. That's it. Thanks for listening. Like, comment, subscribe. You know the drill. Take care.